Uh, welcome back to the 2021 SG Open Virtual. Uh, today we have a really cool new sub segment called the Floorball Roundhouse uh, Mirror of Mind. Uh, without going into much detail, I want to uh, just show, show you all the, the esteemed coaches that we have here today. We uh, are borderless, so we have a, a one coach that is coaching from Switzerland. We have one that is coaching from Finland and one that is coaching from Sweden. Uh, we will start with uh, Mr. David. Maybe you can introduce yourself quickly. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, yep, my name is, is David Jansson. Um, I'm a Swede, but I'm coaching the Swiss men's national team. Um, I've also been coaching Pigsbo Wallenstam in the Swedish league and Florbal Königs in the Swiss league. So uh, looking forward to this. And once again, thanks for the invite. Jonathan? Uh, hi, so Jonathan Rolin is my name. I'm from Umeå, in the nor northern parts of Sweden. Uh, uh, my um, my job is uh, is as a floorball trainer, and uh, I have two parts of my job. The one part is that I'm the coach for Ibo Kodalen in the men's SSL um, for my tenth season going now, and uh, just newly handed the job also to be the national team coach for the men's under 19 here in Sweden. So uh, so that's it. Really nice uh, of you to invite me here. I'm happy to be here. I'm uh, looking forward to uh, talking a little bit extra about the special team situations. Okay. And lastly. Hi, I'm Mikael Dianna. I am uh, from Finland. I uh, live currently in Hamenlinna, which is a city approximately 100 kilometers north from Helsinki. I coach in uh, a team called Hamenlinna Steelers which plays in the men's F Liga, which is the new name for the Finnish highest league. Uh, been coaching many years since I was 17 years old and uh, yeah, love, love coaching and it's really fun. And uh, it's also a big pleasure to be a part of this and excited about our discussion. My topic will be the playoffs. All right. Uh... Sounds great. Uh, we will go straight into it and, and we will start then with uh, Mr. David, uh, who has uh, overtime and penalty shots. And how do you uh, approach them tactically and prepare and train for them? Yep, that sounds great. So I'll jump straight into my uh, presentation here for you guys. So like Philip said, overtime and penalty shots will be my thing for this roundtable discussion. And let's just get straight into the um, overtime situation. So I think there's there are a couple of factors to consider when once you step into overtime mode, and uh, I'll go through them one and one here. So the first one that I'm going to mention is that you go into this one shot decides the game mode, of course. And the thing that is the biggest thing for me is how do I as a coach want the game to play out? It has with my team to do, of course, it also has with the opponent to do. So the things that I think about is one, are we the better team on paper or not? Because if we're the better team, I'm more likely to want to have an overtime where a lot of things happen. Because my belief is that if you're the best team, you're going to benefit from things actually happening on the court. And if you're not, then you'd rather minimize the events that are happening and taking place. And more specific and this goes for if you're a better team or if you're not the better team in what kind of game phases do i think that we have the best chance of winning because the situation is of course so different here normally a floorball game can consist of like it could be like 20 goals you know a game could end 11 9 or whatever and now all of a sudden one goal will decide everything um, in case of it being an overtime winner so it's really important to steer the game to something that favors your own team. So for an example, if you have a team that's strong on the ball, then maybe you want possession. Or if you're a stronger counterattack team, then maybe you would like to counterattack a little bit more. If you're strong in transition, yeah, uh, so on and so forth. And the thing that I always think about too is with what variance am I actually comfortable? Do, do you know, do I want, do I want it to be a back and forth kind of, uh, over time because I think we will be better with that or or do I not want to so that's what goes into my head and that's how I try to I mean obviously don't have a lot of time to 
talk to players about this. So the instructions are going to be short, but that's what goes on behind the scenes kind of in my, in my head. Um, then there's also the, the psychology, uh, psychology aspect of it. Um, how to make sure that my players are in the right state of mind to perform. Um, and this is of course different in terms of what situation you're heading in. You can go into an overtime feeling really good about yourself and you can go into an overtime feeling less good of yourself about yourself, depending on what's happened in the game and if you're a favorite or not. So there are, of course, a lot of things there for people to find out what to talk to the team about. But I think that's very individual in terms of coaching style and what team you're coaching. And then there's also the overtime versus penalty shots dilemma. So normally an overtime will be five or ten minutes. And one thing to consider as well is, of course, if you believe that you have the best chance to win in an overtime, or if you're actually better off if it's a penalty shot uh, situation. This might also influence how I approach the number of events that I want to take place in the overtime. Like if I believe that penalty shots will be a bigger chance for us to win, then I might be a little bit more conservative during the overtime. I'm, I'm never going to play to get to the penalty shot situation, but it might influence my coaching. And me personally, I think that overtime is more random than penalty shots people like to say the other way around but i think one goal can just come out of nothing and penalty shots are actually five against five even though it's not floorball in terms of five on five floorball so it might not be like realistic but i think that's actually more skill than one overtime goal a lot of the time so i wanted to show you some game plans from from real life uh, i'm going to use pixpo when we played playoff games against Varbe and fallen and we were one of the few teams here that actually had an advantage from possession like to keep on so we decided to keep on attacking with ball here because we felt that we would have an advantage playing with the ball and then there's a situation with switzerland against sweden where sweden had would have a pretty big advantage if it would end up as a penalty shootout so we decided to keep on being active with the ball, but we wanted to avoid a lot of transition to keep the number of events low because we felt that the Swedes would benefit from a situation where the um, game would go back and forth. So I'm going to switch over to my video program here and show you a little bit of what I mean. So um, starting with overtime and get the game to play out like you want it. So here are my Pixpo examples for this so this is a decisive fifth game in a best of five and we're playing away against Varberg full capacity crowd and here you'll see a couple of examples where we actually kept on playing um, with the ball trying to create something which is normally maybe not the best strategy in floorball where counterattacks are most of the goals but um if we look at this, this was something that we identified against them, that if we could get a right shot down here in this pocket with the ball, we'd buy ourselves a little bit of extra time because it's tougher for these guys to put him under pressure when he's a right shooter. And we managed oh, to get the ball down to Emil Jülkenen around the net, who then could go in here or could go around here. Jülkenen trampar runt. And this is the end of this series, so... Pretty cool in the fifth and decisive game to be able to win it by your own strengths. And this is kind of the same. This is a quarterfinal against FC Helsingborg, where we're also playing with the ball, pushing towards them to try to decide the goal, uh, shoot the deciding goal. Um, that's one of the goals, but it's actually not the decisive goal. That is the equalizer with the ball. And after that, here, here comes the decisive goal in overtime. We guess played back played into the middle. It's like a mini golf goal. It's a, just an amazing goal. And um, they, that's how we wanted to approach overtimes. And this is the decisive goal in that series. And this is an overtime goal against Fallen in the semifinals afterwards, where we'd also identified that we thought that they were pretty weak in these two pockets. So we wanted to keep on pushing with the ball. And eventually you will see the ball get to one of the best shooters in the world, which is Martin Ostholm, who moves in with it and just hammers it up top corner and this is how we decided this game so we were in a real good flow here with this team where we won a lot of overtime games and it's of course a cool feeling then going over to the penalty shootout and what i think is important here so for shooters i think a big thing is to keep your options open um so 
we will step uh, right into this here. Um, looking at, for an example, a Patrick Malmström here, uh, moving in with the ball on his forward side. And you'll see him twisting and turning back and forth. And I know that he, he never decides what to do until, he, until he's uh, actually in the situation. So, and that's a cool way of approaching it. If you're a shooter, we'll look at Don Hartmann from uh, our semifinals against the Swedes in the last WFC. And he'll do the same thing. So he'll be walking forward, back and forehand, keeping his head up and then deciding what to do. I think you also look for high percentage plays. Like you want your, your players to do things that will reward you long term. And then come these decisions that I think are really interesting. So we will see two between the legs penalty shots here. And I think it's really interesting to, to discuss whether that's a high percentage play or not. We can uh, compare two of them here and then think of what we think about it. So this is Donald Collibson going to his forehand and shooting it between the legs. And this was a scouting decision from Collibson. So he knew that the Helsingborg goalie would move like this. And I'm actually good about that one because I've, that feels like a high percentage play to me. But when we actually decide this game in the, in the sudden death penalties later on, Martin Ostom does this. So he also puts it between the legs, but this is a different kind of motion because he's going from the right to the left and Collipson was going the other way around. I guess this hole, I don't know if it's big enough or if you'd want him in a perfect world to shoot it high. Of course, no one will complain after this. This is just such an amazing goal. And this, by the way, is the same season that I showed you earlier. So we were on a, on a real roll here, winning all tight games there are. And then for goalies, um, it's if you want them to be active or if you want them to passive, I think. Be passive, I think, is, is a big thing here. So here, for an example, you'll see Jonathan Edling from the same shootout. Um, he, I think it was Paulson at the time. Going out with his legs, which actually makes Martin Oston fumble the ball. And I think this is a cool strategy for goalies, at least now and then. Um, to have that kind of thing going for you. And here we see Alexander Rudd against us in the same semifinal that I talked about earlier. We had been talking to Pascal Mayer about him going on his backhand and then shooting it from his backhand or going long to his forehand. And we decided here that we wanted Pascal to speculate a little bit on the forehand side, forcing Rudd to take the backhand shot. So you see Mayer being really ready here. Very slow worship. And it ends up with Rud taking the backhand shot. But I still think slow this worship. is the right play. Even though he scores on this, I think it's better to force him to shoot the backhand shot than to open up the long forehand version, version here. So I think that's a, also a big thing to, to consider for goalies. All right. So let me just um, make a short summary of that. Shooters, look for high percentage plays. Give yourself a good chance to score. Keep options open while moving forward. Goalies, force shooters away from their A game, like cut off angles by being active or be difficult to read and sometimes really aggressive. And then the last part for me, um, how to practice this. So overtime, I think you should use overtime as a tiebreaker, like in your internal games when you get a chance and maybe make it part of a longer competition in the team, like count the number of overtime wins and losses for players during the entire season or something like that. And as soon as you have a tiebreaker, use the overtime. And for penalty shootouts, we have a, a cool thing, I think, with this. We, when we have our internal games, we actually award penalty shots after the games have ended during practice, and they count towards the score. So if Team Red has beaten Team White 3-2 in the normal game, there will still be added penalty shootouts afterwards that count towards the score. And they have to do with how well they have done certain stuff that we think are important for a certain practice. There could be trying to win the ball back or certain zone entries that we want to focus on or other things. And then they get rewarded after the game and then they shoot some penalty shots and they get to decide who takes them and they count towards the score of the actual game, which is a cool way to simulate pressure, which is, of course, otherwise... A really tough thing to do all right guys so that was my short um 
presentation of overtime and penalty shots, but I think it concludes more or less my thoughts about it. I think you're muted, Philip. Okay, that that that's great. Thank you so much for that, David. I, I wanted to see just if anyone had some input uh, or any uh, thoughts. Because I I uh, because I, I I was thinking from me uh, I, I never I, I I was an outfielder if you will but uh, so I was thinking about the new well it's not new anymore but the rule that now you can actually pull pull it back which you couldn't uh, before um, if that has changed anything yet. to me without you know I I I don't know if I'm right about this, but it feels to me that that makes it a lot harder for uh, goalkeepers, but maybe I'm wrong there. No, you're right. Um, and it, of course, can. I mean, in this case, um, it can, of course, alter stuff in terms of what kind of players you have, if you have players that are better suited for the new rules or not. Um, mm -hmm. So it can still matter, but I guess it's just the... Um, the way you see your team towards the other team, and maybe it can it can change if you want to play more or less aggressive during overtime, depending on what kind of penalty shooters you have that are suited for the new rules, I guess. Uh, Michael, I wanted to ask you uh, uh, mainly one, maybe how 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 you do it over in, in in your club team, but also does Finland are they the same rules when it comes to penalties? Uh, as in, uh, what I mean by that, of course, is that if it's a draw, is it is it a penalty to get like an extra point? Uh, yeah, it's, um, I think two or three seasons ago, they tried uh, four against four on overtime. But then, I don't know, that went somehow wrong because then some teams started to play five against four with the empty net and then suddenly it changed, it, changed back. But um, yeah, we have uh, three points per game and then who wins on overtime or penalty shootouts gets two and the losers get, loser gets one. So, yeah. And the uh, overtime varies a bit. I think it's 10 minutes in our league. It maybe it used to be five. They've changed some or many times the rules. So I'm, it's always a bit surprising when you go in the new season and you get to the overtime or penalties. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, you. I would. I would think that if you look at it over a whole uh, whole season, club team contra, uh, as David talked about, you know, national, that could be a lot of points if if you actually have some really good uh, penalty takers. Uh, it could be maybe even the difference between you know survival or or going down to another uh, to the lower division. Yeah, I know, for an, I know for an example, sorry to interrupt, I know for an example in the NHL, in hockey, they've had seasons where they've been talking about teams that would have made it to the playoffs had they been able to win like 50% of their penalty shootouts, like teams that have lost almost every penalty shootout they had and they were into 14 or 15 of them or something like that. And that, of course, can be huge differences for such a big business. I have just a short reflection about uh, the overtime. And I think it's uh, good, and I wanted also to emphasize, emphasize a little bit about what David was talking about. Uh, it should be about your team ident the identity also to play with your strength and so on. And my experience is from the overtime games that we have been in with Dolan, for example. We have almost always decided them with quite, um, I, I don't really know the English word, but quite... Um, <laughs> different kind of goals you know we shoot from our own half there touches to you sticks on the way and bounces to a rebound and then someone smacks it in the net or something like that and really different kind of approach from our side because we are a different kind of team also yeah i would maybe have a i don't know if it's a question or a reflection but for david that because yeah i don't remember that well anymore the semi-final in the last world championship but I really liked the way uh, Switzerland played against Sweden and Finland and uh, when the game went to overtime did uh, as you said that you might go for I don't know more conservative or maybe not try to get the game not to flow that much but did uh, I don't know how to put it in good words but 
kind of secondary thinking that because you knew the the weak points or weak or, or the how you could get Sweden in trouble did you have to think about something in the overtime so that you might still get that good chance for, from your team identity in the overtime or did then the game change so that possibly Sweden didn't try that much to do certain stuff and then probably or possibly they would like to get the game to the penalty shots. I don't know if you can get the idea. It's uh... Yeah, I get 100% what you mean. Um, we were thinking, well, we felt that we, we, we felt we could harm them with the ball in this because we felt that we had, we'd scored a couple of goals where their team got really stretched out um, and they had problem in their man, man slash zone game. Cause they did some, some things that we saw that we felt that we systematically could use. So that w- was what we tried to do. We didn't want to make it go into Hawaii back and forth mode because we felt that that's been a weak point for us against them at the time. And we tried to get, possession and we tried to do some things and get them stretched out as as much as possible i also felt that we were probably underdogs when it came to the penalty shootout but at the same time we had prepared pretty well for it and we'd done a lot of things that we normally wouldn't do so and we also had pascal meyer being amazing in the game so i felt that that's spoke for us in terms of the penalty shootout as well. So I think in a normal game against them, if it had been like in a vacuum, I would have gone harder for the win during the overtime. But the way the game played out and the, the things that we'd actually undertaken to be better at penalty shootouts, I didn't feel necessarily that we had to chase the win in the overtime. So we just tried to get the game to where we thought we could score the goal, which was with possession. And then they slowed it down a little bit more than so we when we didn't have the ball it became a pretty slow overtime, actually. And maybe that was that was something that we could have done. We could have actively chased the ball back. But we were, of course, afraid that we would get too long with our team and that they would beat us in, in a zone where we weren't comfortable. How did you, uh, if we just ask, in those situations, I mean, in an overtime, when you coach a team like Switzerland, and I, I can feel like maybe it was the same way back for Finland before they started beating Sweden <laughs> uh, that you know you come into those situations and, and do you, did you sense that the players changed their their own mentality the, you know or, or how was it? Good question no I actually think that our generation of guys um, sometimes they get painted with the old Swiss colors that they people think that they lack some kind of winning mentality or something. If our guys take that game to overtime against Sweden, they've shown a heck of a lot of winning mentality. And um, when it comes down to that, I know what I was pushing. I was pushing that. I told them that let's go back to before the tournament. That was the only my only message in the little break before the overtime. I said that let's go let's go behind. Let's go to the pre. WFC camp where we're preparing and I tell you that we can jump straight into overtime against Sweden in the semifinals and would you have taken it and of course guys went yeah for sure we would have taken it and that's the message right we're there we're one shot away from beating the Swedes which would be a huge upset something we believe in and yeah let's just jump into this situation and just just go out there and shoot that shoot that goal that that is necessary so that was kind of what I was pushing and then I tactically like I said I wanted us to do some good things with a ball that we ended up not doing, even though we created a couple of good scoring chances on it. Yeah, I remember it's an amazing game. Uh, and, and it's almost, <clears throat> I don't know, you feel it's, it's, it's a little bit uh, that big games like that ends on penalty shootout. It's almost like you want it, even though I understand that you can have maybe some NHL kind where, where sometimes they play like four or five periods. Maybe you can't do that. But it's almost like you, you want one team to actually decide in, a, in the real global part instead of penalties. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I agree from a, like a aesthetical point of view, for sure. But from a fairness point of view, like I said earlier, I think five against five penalty shots is actually in a way more fair than one overtime goal. Just like Jonathan said before, these goals tend to be really weird, except for the Pixel goals that I showed you where we actually managed to play to our strengths. Um, but yeah, I mean, from a fairness standpoint, maybe not, but from like an aesthetical 
floorball point of view, you, then for sure you'd want it to be um, decided on the court five on five, yeah, or yeah, five on four or whatever. Okay. Uh, anyone else have anything else to add into that? Um, because if not, uh, we will just go into the second topic, which will be uh, Mikael, uh, who who will uh, will talk more about uh, playoff, how to train for it, how to prepare in every aspect for it, fitness strategy. Um, and uh, go ahead if you're ready, Mikael. You can just take it all, take it away. Yeah, thanks. So um, yes. So my topic is uh, <clears throat> floorball. Uh, floorball. Yeah, of course, floor, floorball. But playoffs, and uh, there's many things that I can uh, basically lend also from David, as he was talking a bit of the same or not the same, but the setting in a tight playoff game or uh, overtime or a world championship semi-final but yeah so playoffs uh, I think there's a lot of cliches behind the uh, how we speak about playoffs maybe at, at least in Finland maybe it's something that we have been watching a lot of American sports which includes a lot of uh, hero talk and so on but uh from a basic setting, if we look at the, the playoffs and how we get there, we have, uh, I have an example, the F-Liga, the Finnish highest league, and we have 14 teams which play uh, each other two times. So that makes it 26 regular season games of which then out of the 14 teams, eight into the playoffs. And uh, for example, last season, uh, 2020, 2021, uh, you needed to get 38 points uh, to get in the playoffs, which makes it uh, about 1.5 points per game, which means that in order to get to the playoffs, you have to have a certain success in the regular season. Of course, teams are different. Uh, in Finland, we have, uh, say, Classic, who has been winning basically everything for five years. So... Possibly for them, the, the regular season is a different kind of process. But for teams, say, from uh, five to eight, you already need to have a certain level of uh, success and uh, a high basic game level in order to get to the playoffs. And th from there, I will come to the notion that is it some kind of magic tricks or do you try to get use the, the regular season to get your at least the floor of the game as high as possible so that then come play of time you will be at your highest level as a team and therefore these kind of cliches that you have uh, so such as the, the the two games really start in in spring and uh, clutch performance and that kind of stuff it's yeah the narrative is there and when the situation becomes uh, tight then you you get those performances but you start the season in in september and you get the playoffs start in march so you have to have the whole process the arch of the season starting from the the preseason and the training and the preparation for the season you have to get already to a certain trajectory so that you can then be at your highest level in the playoffs of course sometimes teams peak later and then get to a good flow but still the the regular season is uh, an important part of the playoffs and so that's uh, that's an important aspect even though we speak about the playoffs but you can't rule out or count out or put the playoffs in a vacuum um uh playoffs uh what changes then for the re from the regular season is that as I said, you play 13 games, you know, 13 opponents two times in Finland. Uh, it changes. And then when you go to the playoffs, if you win the championship, you play against three opponents. So we have the, the quarterfinal, semifinal, and then the final series. We don't have a, we had for three years the, the superfinal. You, 
for example, you have in Sweden or Switzerland, we changed back now to the series and that is played also as a best of seven series. So what changes is that whereas during the regular season, you might have uh, three games in a week and you play against different kind of teams which play different floorball and you have to prepare for them slightly in a faster pace uh, then when the playoff starts then you can you need to focus on one opponent at a time and then you play so that you have to win each opponent four times in order to get to the to win the championship so that changes the the preparation and the the focus a lot and what comes also we have to take in consideration is the tight schedule because then uh, we play those 26 regular season games we start in september and finish in march and usually the playoffs are done in late april which means that if you play all seven game series you might end up playing a second regular season in one and a half months instead of those six, seven months you play during the regular season. And as an example, last season, we had Nokian Koarpe, which lost to Classic in the semifinal in the seventh game. They played 14 games in 28 games days, plus then they had the bronze medal match. So that's a lot. You play every second game day. So that changes your whole scheduling, that changes the the all aspects so that you basically can't train that much anymore you don't have the normal weeks you have game day recovery day game day recovery day and then you have to squeeze in the recovery and the possible video in feedback and analysis and then some shorter training sessions in those days uh, what is important in playoffs and what changes and what I mentioned earlier about the, the focusing on one opponent, then everything becomes, of course, more specific. So uh, you focus more on, on small, smaller details. You, you probably or you have already the dat data and uh, the previous experiences from the season. You have played two games against the opponent. And then you go more into specific uh regarding uh, the opponent's pressing or defensive zone play uh the opponent's build up do they have certain lines which play a certain game or some different aspects of the game that you have to take in consideration and such as you might not prepare that much in the regular season because you have less time or you have more games in a week and against different opponents. So then you have to prioritize a bit. But um, so that's the most or the biggest thing that changes when you come to the playoffs and everything becomes more specific. And that's really, really important as a coach, because as a coach, you watch videos and you do all the preparing and preparation and you speak with the staff and you you really can go into detail as a coach but then when it comes to the information you give to the players there's really the balance at which how much is too much or how we put out enough information but so that it's not too much because then too much might become too much uh, so um, there's that as a coach because as a coach, you love the moment. You really want to get into detail, and uh, and then oh, we can do this, and that guy does this, and, and we could go on and on and on. But then you have to find the right amount of information and the way to give the information to the players, and uh, so that's an important part as a coach to take in consideration. And yeah, then you scout, and you might. In training, take in consideration how the opponent plays. Some teams like to use a so-called shadow line so that they try to play as the opponent or use a shadow box play of the opponent so that you can get the right uh, setting in the training. 
depends a bit how you do want to approach. I personally, as a coach, find it if if the opponent, for example, does a really good pressing, if we don't do it, then it's maybe hard to use use a shadow line in our training because the question is that can we do it as good as them and if we can't then it leaves the uh, the the preparation a bit i don't know uh, short and then we might in the worst case scenario learn to play against a bad version of the opponent and we're not then prepared in the game but for example, last year in the playoffs in the Finnish first division, the opponent played a, a slightly different kind of uh, box play. So we had a, a shadow penalty kill line in our own training and we could score then on power play. So at least that was helpful. And yeah, so specifics, you go more into detail, you go more into the opponent, you start to know more the opponent and as the series goes forward you get more info and then you you start to get some some uh, i don't know duels against two players against each other or lines against each other and you you might have an idea of when the series begins you have might might have an idea that which lines play against which line but then how the game and the series develops that might change so so that's it's more in the detail then. And uh, more key points as a coach is uh, because the playoffs is, we love the situation, the occasion is, is the best time of the year in a way, because at least, I don't know, my colleagues in Sweden and uh, possibly also in Switzerland, it's, it's the time also when the days start to get longer and you might get some spring spring weather after a long dark winter so yeah then you get some energy out of that also and you the situation is uh, is nice and the occasion but how do you manage that uh, do you stick to the best practices and the and your routines as a team or do you start doing something different uh, there's different kind of schools in this approach i personally think that try to keep everything as normal as possible. Of course, if the schedule changes from your daily or weekly routines, then you might have to add a training on a day that we possibly might not train in a normal uh, regular season setting. But uh, the, the, how to say, there's a risk of uh, changing too much stuff because of the occasion and and the, the the importance of the of the playoffs and uh, so how to keep up in your best practices keep the routine as normal as possible as 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 functional as possible and 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 then as a coach the what changes maybe is also the game analysis and the feedback because say we have a playoff series and uh, we play today and then the next game is uh, on Friday. I need to have, the, I need to work immediately after the game, which during the regular season, I might have one or two days in between so I could do the game analysis more with more time. And that changes a lot how you give the feedback. Do you call players? Do you have, uh, I don't know, now you can do... Uh, chat with uh, lines do you, how do you give the feedback how do you make it more as functional as possible so that you can be ready to the next game and still have time to recover and and, uh, and especially as still a semi pro sport there are players who might work still uh, between the game days so how do you make it so that we are ready but we don't uh, exhaust too much the players as the as the fatigue is also high uh, due to the schedule and uh yeah so as a coach in a way to summarize i would uh, think about the as a coach how to balance in a best and optimal way the the routines of the regular season and and to keep a kind of safe environment and a, 
an environment that the players are used to and at the same time then go into more details into more specific regarding the game and the opponent so that we are as ready as possible and i think the the best playoff teams and the best teams usually do that best and therefore it's not that amount much about i don't know, magic or or that kind of narrative that we get many times from the media and outside observers but from the inside that keep doing the stuff you're good at and then from the regular season starting already and and try to get the floor of your game as high as possible and then see where it leads you but as, as a coach the preparing is uh, is much about finding a right balance and and how to get the most important information to the players thanks okay <clears throat> Um, let's see, can you hear me? Uh, let me see. Can you hear me now? I hear you well, Philip. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for that, Nikhil. I, I, I just have, um, actually, I'll start with one question that is, uh, I can ask you first, Nikhil, but maybe to, to all coaches. It's a little bit different because uh, uh, from this, like an Asian perspective, if you will. Um, Singapore could be one of the teams, maybe even Thailand. Um, they, they would plan for their own Asian uh, championship where they play, uh, play the other Asian nations and, and they want to be one of the top, top three or top four to, to reach the World Cup. And in, in those games, usually they will be the controlling team, if you will, the team that is actually moving the ball and, 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 and being much, much more aggressive slash uh, offensive. And then if they succeed in that tournament, they will go to the World Cup. And, and all of a sudden that changes maybe a little bit, uh, depending on which group they, they end up in. Uh, this year, Singapore, I think, is in a, in a good, good group for them. But they would still play maybe some European teams or if they they, I, I'm, I know that that some Asian teams have a target to to actually come first or second in that first phase in the group to play a really really good European team. Uh, so it's kind of like, how do you plan it? Do you would you still plan it uh, from a perspective to to win in Asia and to to improve your floorball in the sense of offensive offensively? Or would you go more into the defensive part and counterattacking? Because you know that, that that is something probably you need to do to be successful in the World Cup. Yeah, that's a, that's a difficult question. Because if, say, Singapore is a really good country in Asia, a really good team in Asia, then you get, even though if you train the defensive phase and the counterattacks, you might not get the right uh, setting in those games so then it's difficult then when you really don't know where you are in that and then you come for example the, to the world championship and play against a really good team so yeah it's it's i would say that the whatever is the team's identity and where the team is good at try to in a way, maximize that. And then, of course, you have to take in consideration the weakness and, and prepare also for the, for the other challenge. So that, say, Singapore plays against a really good European team. You know that you have to be without the ball. You know that you have to be ready defensively. And what happens then when you win the ball and that kind of stuff. But it's, it's, it's difficult because, because at the same time, you need to, to have the, the, that challenge also in the, in the normal setting. So... But yeah, if of course, then it should be taken in, in consideration how to how to improve also the weakness or the, the situation you might get in, in in the World Cup. David, did you have something? I did, yeah. I think looking at this, I can make a, a quick connection to what I talked about during in the overtime 
if what I talked about in overtime is the micro perspective of it, saying that you want to steer a game to certain situations. Um, the things you're talking about is something that we do as well. We play teams that we on paper should beat, but they're good teams. And then we have a situation where we're maybe not the favorites on paper anymore and we have to change the way we play. Um, I think that's kind of the thing you want to do is you want to put yourself in a favorable situation, regardless if you're better on paper or not better on paper. That's kind of the thing. And how to do that, that's, of course, up to every coach deciding on where they think they have the best chances. Um, but I also wanted to touch base a little bit on what you talked about, about counterattacking. And let's just define counterattacking as winning the ball from the opponent and then creating transition scoring chances afterwards. You can do this against all opponents, I would say, even though you're Singapore and maybe you're actually pushing the play and you're the better team, that doesn't mean you can't counterattack. It, maybe you have to find other ways tactically to counterattack if the other team is very destructive with the ball. So the way I look at it is that I try to analyze what they want to do with the ball and then i try to set our defensive system so that we can still cause turnovers because yeah look at how they play if they just throw long balls and you have to adapt and try to trick them into trying to do something with the ball or just push them so hard that they have no time to react so you can still counterattack. it's just a matter of how you want to address the defensive game or the play without the ball yeah um I from from my perspective, uh, one of the, the the huge benefits that hopefully we will get through this with SG uh, Global Open is that Asian teams in Asia in, in Singapore uh, for next year then in 2022 will actually get get a chance to play against uh, uh, European teams and hopefully it will be not just Swedish it will be fin Finnish and, and Swiss teams in the future so I think. Uh, it's so hard for them to have, you know, oh, let's have a friendly against Sweden or Finland. Oh, okay, yeah, let, let's fly there. It, and 15 hours later, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not easy for them to have these kind of friendlies or, or I don't know if a friendly is, is even considered a real true game. But uh, by having, experiencing uh, playing against uh, European players at a younger age will probably be very beneficial. Yep, 100%. Great. Yeah, um, and it, uh, the whole sport, I think, needs more, uh, yeah, international games. And I was coaching the Italian national team, which made it, I know the situation, as uh, it's really hard to get kind of even uh, national team games. Then you have the world championship qualifiers, and then you might play the first game against Switzerland, which is then it's just hard and then you might have maybe one or two games against a similar opponent and then so i think what you said about the the asian players playing more games against different opponents that's the it's what every team needs as at the especially at the national level club le level is different because we then play leagues and that kind of surroundings but uh, it's it's really for national team level, it's it's somehow we should increase in the lower tier the inter the number of international games. I think the top four countries play already a good amount of good quality games, but then coming down from the maybe the after the top eight, both European level and then global level, somehow try to get more interaction and more uh, equal level games, so to say. Okay, uh, uh, Jonathan, I just wanted to ask you, uh, uh, from this last season, did, did you change anything in, in, in the way you guys played uh, Ibuka Dolan between, uh, you know, the, into the playoff, if you will? Uh, there's, uh, <laughs> there's only so much that you can, uh, how, how do you say it? Uh, you, have to, you have to be focused about what you can, uh, what you can, um, Povarka, what's the name in English, David? Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's so just so many things that you can influence. So so keep them keep them on quite quite short notice or quite short list. So for us, it's, we have been working all season about how we should play floorball and be uh, mainly mainly focused about the, about that type of situation. So of course, for us, when we get to playoffs and we get the week preparations, we cannot change that much. But what we had done during the season, I think, was the big part for us also that we had our players to 
maybe one time every week we had one hour with the with the psychologist also many of the times and that we practiced to to talk to each other the players had to talk to each other and had to coach each other also so i think many of the detailed situations that Mikael was talking about earlier that can also be handled by the players in a game situation victor can tell rasmus that okay kim gonovic he always puts his stick to that side when when i fake the pass inside then there's a pass open and if you get them to talk to each other on a regular basis, then they also can provide support in the playoff situation. But the main structure for us was quite the same, at least. Yeah, and maybe I'd like to add, maybe to my topic or the subject that it's, as also Jonathan said, that the regular season and what you do during that is really, really important. And then I think many times we coaches, for example, come the playoffs, then we get too deep in our heads and then we start to focus on a lot on the opponent and then we might forget our own team and then still stick to your own strengths and then find the way there because it, yeah, as Jonathan said, it's in, in a week's time, it's, you can't change your game upside down. You just have to adapt your game, yeah probably a bit, but still keep to your identity and in what you're good at. David? Yeah, I agree. I think there's a very important thing in terms of what you um, send out to your players when playoff starts, like both of the guys now have mentioned, like it's not another sport. It's the same sport. Maybe the refs will change their level a little bit. And of course, the, the opponents will go a little bit deeper into scouting. But it, it sends out a very panic signal to me if you want to change something around big time, then it, it kind of degrades what you've been doing all season long. Um, so I still think you should just keep, stick to your guns, of course. But the thing about when you do the changes are the things that Jonathan mentioned with players adapting within the series, but also you as a coach with a set best of seven series. That's so long. It's seven games. You can't blame bad luck after a seven game series, I think, but like changes within the series, the series have a life of their own. That's a big thing though. Changing before the first playoff game. No, uh, keep to your stick to your guns. But once you feel that, something slipping out of your hands during a series that's where you can do the smaller changes the special teams and how to approach certain stuff all right uh yeah th uh, that was great Mikael. thank you so much for that input uh, and we will go into the last uh, topic uh, before we go to the questions and uh, it will be jonathan with the special teams yeah uh, okay um... Okay, let's go then. <clears throat> okay, for me, it's a um, special team, special place, it says here. But for me, it's um, it's a part of the game, I want to say first. So it's it's one part of the bigger picture. And then I will try to explain a little bit how, how I reason about it. Uh, so I think first, historically, we have to understand a little bit what about what, uh, for me, the Swedish floorball player is coming from, what he's like grown up with uh, during his junior years as a floorball player, what expectations there is, because there are certain expectations and certain habits that are tough to break, I think, and uh, that are quite quite rooted with you since you are young. For example, in the power plates in Sweden, it's uh, common that you have to have some structures. You have to take your time, find a good shot. If I only take and speak in bigger terms, that's my view, at least how it's been historically. In box play, you you often you play low, you block shots, you take you put your stick in a passing line, and in free hits, yeah, maybe you have some different structures or variants that you have decided before. It's it's how it has looked over time in Sweden, I think, and something that we have inherited for from the generations before us, and of course that uh, that. Um, uh, that carves out the kind of behavior what the player shows also on the field. And if, and if you just look at uh, my point of it is, is that if you look at this kind of play, power play situation, we get the ball and there's two minutes, we put the pass in the corner, we put the pass up, the ball moves around. Yeah, but we, we, we don't really look to the net 
um, then it goes 20 seconds, it goes a little bit more than 20 seconds, still nothing happens. Uh, yeah, you, I think you understand my point. And, and this is not, then something happens. After 40 seconds, Alexander has a shot. We stay in the four check with Anton Okerlund and Hedlund. They win the ball back now. On the Mulsha player, we get another situation, we get another shot at the goal, they panic around, they throw the ball away. And then something finally happens. Same thing here, we have 20 seconds left on a power play, we have a bad pass, five seconds goes away. You take your time when you get the power play. That's historically how it works. You have to be sure when you take your shot, it's a good opportunity. Uh, wait for it, and so on. Yeah, you, you understand my point. Historical, from a historical point of view, that's normally how it goes. And so I think that <clears throat> if we want to start changing that, and I want to start changing that with my team also, then we have to start look at special places as part of the game. Uh, but the bigger picture is the main focus po point. So uh, it, it would be interesting to see, uh, to make a connection how we play for floorball in general to how we take on special play situations. How can we make that that work together also in a better way. Um, if we play in high intensity floorball, for example, like we have tried to do, if we try to put the four check, yeah, why why do we always want to stay still and wait for the opponents to shoot when we get the, to play in a box play? Why? It doesn't make sense anymore. Uh, why should we have well calculated taking shots and take our time um, instead of taking many shots and win the ball back? We should have greater odds to win the ball back since we are one man more on the field. Um, why should we have structured free hits uh, when we can start the game as fast as possible to create a new attacking opportunity? So I think that just try to make a connection to what team do we want to be? What is our strength to play on? And how can we optimize it in a special play situation? For example, then if we talk about the power play situation, I think that training methods, um, yeah, you can try train classic and for me, David can <laughs> fill out later on for me, but I think that in Sweden, if you play like classic power play situation in training, you play five against four, when, when the box play win the ball, they just give it back to the power play and then you go again. I think that many young players are raised by that system in Sweden. Um, and I also would like to change a little bit that, that we can go closer to the game situation that uh, also in the training situation. I think now this is just questions for me to send out because I don't have any answer to all what is the best power play because then we would score all the time. No one has to like the best answer to a question like that. But I think that you should ask yourself, why is the point player always, always the one calling the shots in the power play? What happens if you play, change it to a player on the wing instead? If the right uh, wing player he, he's the one calling all the shots, is, can that get you in bigger threat situations in the power play? I also try to talk to my players about if we think that we should score, if I look, uh, if I follow your line on this training when we are practicing power play, who will score the goal? I, I can ask them that question. Okay, they, then will, they will ask me, okay, the guy who gets the best shooting opportunity will score the goal. And I will try to tell them that that's not enough for me. I want you to think a little bit more who should score the goal. And I want them to tell me, okay, Rasmus will score the goal. And this is a little bit how it will look like. If we cannot go that way, then we try to go this way. Not to have like the dots and arrows and this, like the structure figure out, but work your way back from the optimal situation. I think that also can be an interesting take. Uh, for example, if, you, if we talk about, we want to have a long pass and then we want to attack the net. Okay, good. So cross pass sometimes can be tough because they are so prepared for it but still look for the big pass and when you get the big pass through then you can shoot for the net so big pass maybe between or else over because big pass pass past the central line then we get a little bit of opening for the net and maybe an opening to score the goal so that can be one example of if i look at your line this training okay when do i know that you feel that you have succeeded not only by scoring the goal but what is like the focus point this time and for us it also has to be connected a little bit to our identity as a team a little bit more aggressive with the ball a little more shots 
rather than fewer shots, uh, this, then this could be one, one point to bring. Um, six against five, a little bit the same situation. I prefer with our team that we can get them to turn their head one time, then see if we can change the side, attack the net, and then go for the rebound or the second goal. And the goals in these situations, they often look like this for us because this is the type of team we are and this is the type of floorball that we, that we feel best about. If we keep the ball for 40 seconds and try to pass the ball around to be able to get the ball into the, a guy in the middle, yeah, then we probably most of the time lose the ball instead and get a goal in our own net. Uh, <clears throat> if we look a little bit, talk a little bit about box play also. I think it's, it should not always be about who should block every shot. Uh, how can we be pro proactive instead? And same thing for, same thing for me here. Uh, for us, it has to be connected a little bit more to how do we play as a team? What focus points do we have? What identity do we have? Yeah. Then we want to in trainings to be aggressive and try to win the ball. We want to have many players active, maybe even three box play lines sometimes. Keep the change short and eager to go, ready to put the four check on. Not always about the structure, not always about to sit back and watch what our opponents are, are supposed to do. How can we be proactive about the situation? Because if you talk too long about who is responsible for one passing line or one cross pass, if you put the four check early with the right timing, then there is no top passing line to take out because then you have already taken out your opponents. So you can view it differently. I will just show you some examples from our from our different box play situations. If we try to go close to our opponents before they can handle or before they can be clear what, about what to do in the situation, then there's not so easy to take the decisions, even if you are one, one guy more on the field. Of course, it doesn't look like this every game, but to make a point that it also can, it also can look in look differently. It doesn't doesn't have to look the same way. And also in our own half, if we go early before they have control in the situation and be quite aggressive in the four check, yeah, then we can go, we can block a shot, and then we can go on on the second ball. Even if you are three against five, for example, we can go to fight in that situation. Sometimes, of course, it doesn't work out so well. <laughs> It's good from Anton Oklund in the, and Rasmus Andersson in the first situation here. Create a quite good good situation. If he just runs down to the middle, our left winger, then he probably can take that pass out. It looks so easy sometimes if you slow down a little bit too early. But we know that this can happen for us when we, when we try to be a little bit more aggressive in the box play, for example. There's a Swiss guy scoring there, Jonathan. Mm. You can't stop these guys. <laughs> yeah, lazy guys. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so three hits in it. I, I, I will just, uh, same thing here, connected to team identity. Uh, if structured, how about just two, maybe three different uh, type of structures that you really actually use? Because my experience, or I think the guys are grown up with also in the Swedish floorball is that you have to have like 15 different type of routines and the other one has to be tougher than the other one or more advanced. And for me, it's just about easy, clever, three hits, maybe one, two passes, and then shoot, and then just have two or three of them, and that's enough. If you do them over and over again during a regular season, when you face different teams, they will never scout you anyway. They will be surprised about it. So just use your, use your, uh, how to say, your skilled players' best skills and, and try to get an advantage. For example, everyone knows that Christopher Andersson who played with other last season, he has a really good shot. So we, if we can fake that, then it's good for us. Just a pass, they will go for the shot and you one can get the shot instead. So just easy, one, two passes, and then you go. Have some easy structures, two or three things maybe, and that's it for me. Yep, that's it. I got a question about, uh, there was a question before about how do you think there's good numbers in power play, box play? I just um, made a fast compilation here uh, for the last season for Dalen. Uh, this is our numbers, power play plus box play. In this case, if you get a good total around 100% or actually a little bit more, if you can see. Uh, I think there's this is playoff seasons for us. The two seasons for me, when I've missed the playoffs, then we have had a lot about maybe 75, 80% in total about the power play and box play. So somewhere over 100%. Uh, 
and that's power play box play together for me because it's yeah it goes quite even out for us in the season how many power plays and how many box plays we get yeah okay that's it feel free to share in thoughts yeah i can take two things uh, off the hip here because i was thinking about it first and foremost great content jonathan thank you very much um the thing you mentioned about not necessarily having to play the ball around for 30 seconds alibi ish uh, i so much uh, agree on this like we that's interesting being a national team coach, of course, because you will have to merge players coming from different club teams that have different strategies within the power play. So we have this had this discussion a lot with Nikola Bischoff Berger when he's been playing the point for our power play. Like, I want him to shoot if he finds something that we like, like a high percentage play that we like. For example, what you mentioned with passes over the central line, that would occur after three seconds. I want him to shoot. If it would occur after one fifty-seven, I would want him to shoot, and. It's, of course, regardless of how he's been during the game, how the situation happens, like that's not interesting. As long as we bring him on the court for the power play, he's expected to shoot out of positions where we want him to shoot. And that's a big thing. And he'd go, but in the club team, they'd want me to run the ball for 30 seconds. And I just don't get the point. It's, it's so weird. Like two minutes, if you're active on the power play, two minutes, a lot should happen if you if you shouldn't create a couple of high danger scoring chances and maybe score the goal and then you'll end up with these results that we saw from your team like a close to 50 percent efficiency i personally think two minutes is too long of a time i think we only copied hockey in that and i think it, it doesn't make sense for floorball because as our play um ratios come up to 50 percent that puts the referees in a really bad spotlight as well because every second time they whistle a power play they actually whistle a goal so that increases the, the potential for the referees being in the spotlight for a for the wrong reasons, which is they're, they're, the, what they're doing is hard enough. And then the other thing, and this is a little bit of a tip from, me, from my side, you were talking about the classic thing where you give the ball back when you practice power play. That is, yeah. of course, how it normally looks and makes for people not being very, of course, into it, especially the ones playing the PK penalty kill and Mikkel mentioned it as well um, about the shadow box. If you want to try to, play another team's system so if you play another team's system you can't do that very well and the players are not engaged that's of course not good for you because you can't measure your power plays success uh, what we try to do is we try to take the net on the power play side the power play net and move it almost up to the middle line like maybe six seven meters away from the middle line and put a goalie in there and let the pk counterattack. so when they win the ball they get a counterattack, and then we we have a long competition during our uh, entire WFC World Championship campaign and players can earn points in these situations where they then end up uh, we end up summarizing all of these points and they get awards and, and prizes and stuff after the after the World Championship so that, I think that's a really good way of making it a little bit more intense that the box play guys actually have something to work towards Yeah, we have tried different things also like that thing but I uh, could but to get it going, get it going a little bit more uh, in the power play also. But but I think that I, I also I, I try to say that we try to do it differently. But I think that the luggage that they carry uh, from that is it's uh, yeah, it's so uh, it's so many years with just getting the ball back when you when you lose the ball yeah. in the power play. And and I think to be really efficient in a game, you have to feel like okay, it's no problem. We can shoot. We are a good force check. We can win the ball back easy again. We can take another shot. It's no problem. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. So it's but it's a good tip, and I, I recommend all, all trainers to think a little bit about how how you actually want it to look to be as close as the game as possible. Yeah, hundred percent. I was thinking, uh, Mika, more for you because uh, uh, I feel uh, Finland has always been uh, really good at at special teams, in my opinion. Um, I remember, I think I mentioned this to David uh, before, but I was, uh, at that time, I was, of course, maybe uh, cheering for Sweden. But when Sweden and Finland played in the last World Cup, you are people left, left to, did I pronounce that correctly? He scored a, on a great free hit combination that I saw them actually do exactly the same in the semi final against Czech, but he did not score in that one. But they did it uh, again in the final. Um, <coughs> from their own uh, right uh, uh, corner on a hit in, if you will. And he scored. And I can't remember exactly which goal it was, but my, my first 
reaction was that how did the Swedish team not plan for that? Or, but maybe that's wrong. Maybe, maybe it's something that, that, uh, that you can't plan for, even though I felt that they could because they saw it in, in, in the semi. But I was thinking just uh, before I get too long here, um, it feels like Finland are a little bit more in, innovative when it comes to these kinds of, uh, kind of things. Yeah, uh, I think in the national team context, we, at least those years, we've been good. So 2008, 2010, uh, we had a strong player person or many players from SSV. So they had a lot of uh, experience from club level. And the same is now, which I think is a big uh, challenge for Sweden is that we can basically put almost two lines from classic, which then train four or five times a week. So then all the small nuance in the free hits and uh, that kind of stuff comes slightly more fast and then more vari variation variation in the in those situations. And so, but it's it's quite actually quite fun. We were preparing for the league and. It's funny to see that, for example, Classic doesn't have a really good power play, which doesn't make sense if you watch at the watch the who is playing the power play. But it's actually not that good. I don't know. Maybe there's a, there's too much options, and then it becomes so that no one really makes the the option. But I had for Jonathan or the his point about the uh, the the point calling the shots or that kind of stuff. I think it's. Many times in from the box play point of view, and then it can be applied to the power play, is that you can usually identify someone who is really not... You have the, the power play, but there's usually one player who is a bit far from the actual danger situation. And we have approached it sometimes so that, say, we have a a point for example or we play maybe with more with two defenders the one defender who might look as a uh, free that he also would shoot and preferably in the beginning of the power play so that it gives also the box play the opponent's box play a, a signal that he is also dangerous so to say so that you could activate somehow all five players so that it doesn't look obvious because sometimes it really looks obvious, even though you have five good players, but there is that one, two guys that probably won't shoot. So then it makes the penalty killing not easier, but you can maybe coach it in a different way. And so, yeah, that, that was a point or uh, uh, something to add to, or say to Jonathan about the, 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 this, dilemma of the point or someone calling the shots uh david you have you raised your hand i did i'm a good uh, student um yeah i just wanted to quickly get back to that goal that you mentioned that i know was a big goal in the finals um i actually want to um defend the swedes a little bit here because of the fact that i think this free hit is from somewhere around the middle line a little bit more towards the finish side of the zone um, and he does it really well and it's, it's well executed, but I think if you, if you want to pre-scout that, then it goes so way down on the priority list for what you want to pre-game scout that if they would have taken this up on the video, the video would have been so long that they would have had, uh, probably like, um, attention issues with the players where the players wouldn't have been, you know, um, taking care of the more important tactical stuff so i could kind of understand that what i want to critique though is that the, it on a national team level where people come from different systems i think it makes sense to have like a maybe a zonal way of defending all of these free hits so as, as long as a free hit is in a non-dangerous situation how do we defend them that's something i think you could have like you'd have some kind of over overlay system where how you want to approach it um, but the actual set play to defend that in a certain specific way i think that's thinking too much of the time and the uh, that they have on their hands all right anyone else have anything to add
Uh, th that's great. Uh, we we uh, we have. I hope you guys have uh, just a little bit of time for some of the questions, uh, and we will end it uh, after that. Um, and I will I will start with uh, actually one of the questions Jonathan already answered here. So um, maybe we could go with uh, this is a uh, an interest more of an interesting perhaps uh, question in asia because you still have uh, you have a lot of righties compared to lefties uh, so they said uh, any tips for power play when the team is full of players who play on the same stick side yeah a big thing there you can combine it with what jonathan already said and that's of course that in this situation you definitely don't want your point player to be the one uh, calling the shots like if you have only let's take a little bit more of an european no let's go with the asian approach let's go with only righties in this case, you'd want your playmaker on the right side, most probably, because on that side, you'd have at least four one-time options with the other guys. So you would typically, if a team is not well prepared, you'd see them throw out five players on the same handedness and they'll steer from on the, on the Asian example from the left side, which means that you can for sure run in and shoot like shots, but there will be almost no good uh, one-timer opportunities. So then my advice would definitely be steer from the right side if you're only righties and make sure to have the most talented playmaker on the right side. So find some kind of pocket between the, the two defenders that will probably be on that side, um, meaning the, yeah, the top player and the D player, so to speak, on that side. Um, and it's going to be beneficial actually to be a righty over there because it's going to be impossible for them to put pressure on you since you can protect the ball towards the boards. So that's a, a no brainer, I think. Uh, I think that you can also like turn the ball behind the net, go up for a right-handed shot. If you start on the other side, pass the ball around, go behind the net. Then you have also you have the right angles to make the like passes on one touch. Also, if you pass the ball on the left side down, pass the ball over, and then pass the ball up, you have the right type of angle also. But but I think that you can also look at maybe Sami Koski in the, mm -hmm. yeah in SPV. He also plays on the left side in the power play in, in SPV. And I think we have met him many times in Dolan also and he's really good from that position. He can he can protect the ball if he gets the force check. If we go too hard he can just pass the ball big through to the other side and they can attack from that side and he can also shoot. So it's shoot for the far post uh, with that with that hook. So it's yeah, I think it's it should create some opportunities. Also, I think I like to view it in a positive way. Yeah, I, I, want to add, I wanted to add that uh, we can I can also find some video footage about yes, Aspeve is a good example. I think they're at least during their best season. I don't know this season, but they have been long, a long time playing with the power play with only left-handed players, which makes Sami Koski plays. Yes, on the left side, and he is really good in, in doing the, the right things from there. And I think also, if I'm not mistaken, Oilers might also have in one power play only left so that uh, Rasmus Kainulainen plays on the on the left side. So it's, it's not a problem. It's just uh, actually many times we think it conservatively so that we put the, if we have, say, in the European context, we might have... In, in a bad situation, two or three rights in a, in a team, then we put that one right in the power play because he is right-handed. And we think it in a conservative way that we have to have that right-handed right player there because no one really knows just that we have to have the right-handed player. So it's, it's not a problem. It's just about then. I can think, I can look for some uh, video footage for the interested person. It's, of course, you have to then look it from a different way because it's all left-handed but the 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 idea applies yeah that sounds great uh i think everyone would would love for that to, uh, to be able to see that either in, in uh next year also which i will come to uh later on but uh another another question for you Mikael, since i have you here now uh is it is it normal to have a checking line in playoffs against the top formation of the other team and uh, one or two more offensive other formations? Uh, it depends on the, of course, on the team and the coach's mentality. It's, I personally would just try to do the line matchup so that what is 
in our favor or what I think or the team think is it's in our favor. <clears throat> but for example, um, not last, but the one before season, until the season got uh, cancelled because of the COVID-19, we had a playoff series against Nokia with TPS and they wanted to play their third line against our first line, which made the, the whole whole rotation for us a bit difficult. And I think we lost there a bit of the, how, how to say the control of the game because we were con focusing a lot of, on who is playing against whom. But yeah, you can do if if, if, if matches the, the strengths and so on. But usually try to get, usually the number ones play against the number one lines and, and so on. But it, it depends on what kind of players you have. If you have a really good kind of checking line, it's a, it's a good way. But yeah, if the best would be then that if the checking line could really get the ball back and then uh, come to get the next line who is coming in to get the ball. So it's, it's a bit in that that what is our aim and what we try to do if we try just to neutralize the, the op offense opponent's line and so that they don't score or do we get an, uh, an, an advantage from that so that we can get back the ball and then get a new line with the ball in. So it depends on the personnel you have at hand. Okay, great. Uh, one question for you, David. Um, if you have a goalie with a specialty in the penalty saving, but has not played uh, in the game at all. Uh, would you uh, would you switch him in in for the penalty shootout? Yes, would I would. <laughs> for sure, I would. Uh, would of course talk about it pregame so that both goalies are are um, you know into the plan. But uh, yeah, I would for sure. It's very specific. Like I said earlier, that's the knock on penalty shootouts. I think generally that it's just not floorball, but because of the fact that it isn't normal floorball, that also requires specific skills from the goalies. Yeah. Yep. Great. Uh, uh, Jonathan, Jonathan um, how are you with this? Uh, this actually, I, I would like to hear it from all, all, uh, all of you, the perspective, but uh, when, when a team is trailing in a game uh, and you play six men, you try and to try to get a goal. What do you emphasize on, and how different is the setup opposed to traditional power play situation? And I just add because you, you've seen, uh, I think we all have seen uh, multiple situations where teams are more or less out in that game. They're losing by two, three goals, and then they actually pull the goal in. Sometimes they can get back into the game, and, and maybe it goes back to what what I think you mentioned, uh, Jonathan, that. Perhaps teams don't really train it much. Yeah, okay. So where to start? I think that um, yeah, for us, six against five hasn't been a really good type of mode. It has been quite okay. But for us, it has been a little bit more about being aggressive, a little bit more aggressive in the six against five. Um, and, and I think that many of the teams why we had tried that approach is that many of the teams are getting quite passive in the five against six they are not putting the four check they are even inviting us a little bit to bring the ball forward but if we pass the ball around for too long i our experience is that then we will then we make the mistake and they then they get the goal instead but if we if we dare to be quite aggressive in the beginning against the six against five we all we quite often get an early goal and, and get that little bit momentum what you are talking about but it's also for us about in the five against six that we try to dare to be a little bit more aggressive in the five against six to send a signal to our opponents also that if you pull the goalie okay then then you have to be a little bit stressed out about it also not to give them the time to cool it down david i think during a, a longer season i think six on five also has a big like value in terms of you as a coach showing your team that you give your team a chance to win games like like you said philip um t go coming back from th uh, three goals down for example that's not a big thing in floorball that happens all the time it rarely happens in hockey and we tend to think hockey or football soccer at times in our brains and we shouldn't because this is a different sport so three goals down that's not a biggie um i always 
tell my players that if you feel that I didn't give you a chance of winning the game, regardless of how big or how big we lose, whatever happens, that's on me. I need to make sure that the players come out of the game thinking, well, coach gave us a chance today. And that'll be pulling the goalie as well, regardless if you have to do it 10 minutes before the end of the game, because you want to send a signal to the players that you're competitive and you want to give them a chance to actually win the games. And six on five is an underrated tool in terms of signalizing what you want to achieve as a coach with your team long term. Like I would hate it as a player if the coach didn't pull the goal, for an example, or, or if he pulled it too late or we didn't get a chance or I felt we didn't get a chance, maybe. You know, it, players, the feelings of the players shouldn't be underestimated. Yeah, good. Really good. Really good. Okay. Uh, Mikael, do you have anything to add to that? or? Uh, no, not that much. I think the six against five is, uh, we many times think that it's difficult to train because the, yeah, in a way it is because it, in the training setting, it's maybe the stress is lacking from the, the team who is play, playing five against six and so on but I think one important thing is that as David said that we might take sometimes we might take the goalkeeper really late out and then becomes that kind of not panic but it makes the team play in a hurry and then many times happens that you take the goalie out to play six against five and you lose the ball and then they score in the net because we were in a hurry and it was a panicky moment so that we can also train that how do we start it so that we get the control and then make it uh, as a, as normal as a situation it can be so that we don't panic and hurry and then lose the ball that we take the control and then we see what we can do and this, i think that's one one aspect of the six against five which many times hits uh, us in the in, in our own leg that we hurry and then we panic and lose the ball yeah okay um, last question um and it's a question that for all of you and and uh we can start with you M Mikael. then um if you could pick one or two sports to get inspiration from and uh, things to ad uh, adapt to floorball when it comes to playoff special teams or or uh, or anything in general actually uh, which sport would that uh, would that be? Uh, it hasn't got that much to do with floorball, but I am a big, big American football fan. I, I follow the NFL every Sunday, many games, and watch watch highlights and a lot of games in the season. And yes, as a game, it's really different because it's not a free flowing game. It starts from a set play moment. But I think there's a lot of things to learn and. Uh, and in a way try to or it raises good ideas and and thinking how the the culture of of, of coaching and and i think that from there i personally can can learn a lot about preparation and and the process even though the sports is different so i i find american football and a kind of inspiration for me I also uh, is it I've heard a rumor that you actually have a have a podcast about uh, American football. Yes, we have a podcast, but that's not I don't understand the game that well. So it's not about the tactics and the, the previous game. It's more about uh, a cultural thing, how to look at uh, at the United States through the NFL. So it's it's a different kind of project. But yes, we have. OK, all right. Uh, any other sports or is that the, the, that's the number one? Uh, not really. I, I don't know why I used to be a big football fan, but I lost completely interest. I don't know why. I just lost it. So, yeah. Oh, all right. Uh, you, Nathan? Yeah, well, I'm all out floorball. So it's, um, <clears throat> of course, I can, I, I'm a sports guy. I've tried all, almost every sport since I was small, of course, but and I appreciate to watch sports. But I, I think that we have an, also an important role in our, in our help to make floorball grow also, that we talk about floorball with uh, people around us, that we, we try to also encourage the guys or girls that are, that are football nerds or what to say, that they, they can actually enjoy floorball also. So I tried to run a little campaign at, uh, at the places I am when they start to talk about the Premier League games that this week and I start to talk about the SSL games this weekend instead. 
And so I try to watch many floorball games. I'm happy that I can see more games live now. That's another another thing for me. Uh, the sports is a lot about the emotions, about the decisions on the field, about everything that connects. And then there's, just to give you an example, then I will stop talking, but just to give you an example from ice hockey, for example, I think that uh, I can take one or two things from, from different uh, settings. But uh, in, in hockey, for example, the tackles are, are, are for a purpose. When the puck goes down to a corner and a defender tackles their opponent, it, it is to freeze the opponent. It's not to win the puck. And I think that floorball, for example, in our own corners, the defenders has so much on their table. They have to beat their opponents in a one against one and they also have to take the ball from the situation and then make the pass in the turning to get to create the scoring opportunity and i think that we can involve some support players in the floorball in a more way like for example hockey you eliminate the player by tackle but there's another player coming to take the puck away uh, so you can get if you think it a little bit like that in floorball so you engage more players on the field in every situation for example Uh, David? Yeah, um, I think to me, I'm a little bit torn apart when it comes to hockey. I agree with the, the separation puck player thing that uh, Jonathan mentioned here. And I also think that there's been stuff like handedness. For an example, you see the D in hockey a lot of times playing the sticks facing the boards, which opens up for other angles. And you see that in floorball a lot. So I think that's something we can take. But um, trying to connect back to what Jonathan said about actually speaking about floorball as much as possible, which I think is a great point. Um, there's actually been some really interesting development if you look at the NHL for the last five, six, seven years. Like look at the Washington Capitals PP with Alexander Ovechkin or look at the Tampa Bay power play with Stamkos and Kutrov. They're playing the sticks facing inside. So they're playing a 1-3-1 floorball power play actually something we've done for 25 years in this sport and that's what's happening in the nhl that's the these are the best power plays at the time look at the penalty shots in nhl nowadays they slow it down and they come in really slow to be able to deke the goalies out and that's something we've done for a long time so actually hockey is i'm not saying they're copying us but i'm saying that a lot of skilled europeans like kucherov like ovechkin people that i talked about they've been playing floorball growing up and it's not a coincidence that they are now in actually using power, um, floorball stuff in hockey. Um, but to the question, basketball is the main thing for me. Um, it's five on five. It has a, a similar uh, setup. In, and the more man-man based floorball gets, the more interesting I think uh, it's, it will become to copy basketball. Uh, the only difference is, of course, it's way easier to keep possession in basketball because you can only hold on to the ball if you want to. That's, of course, not as easy with the with, uh, floorball. But it's kind of the same. You can set up the place you want to. You can set up the positioning you want to. And I think there are a lot of good things to steal from basketball. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I, I really want to thank you all for this, uh, for this first segment of uh, Roundtable. Um, it was amazing, actually. Uh, and uh, to all subscribers, please put in the calendar that these guys will be down in June 2022 in Singapore. And then we will actually have a, our first round table, but it will be live. That means that you all, viewers, can watch them, talk to them, and probably interact in, in a way that uh, is going to be groundbreaking as well. Uh, and that will be in SG Open uh, 2022 in June. Uh, but until then, thank you so much to all of you uh, for this first roundtable. Um, I hope you enjoyed it as much as uh, I'm sure all the viewers did. Thank you very much. Take care, guys. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. See you guys in Singapore. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. See you. Yeah.